Hey, hey, it's Dr. J. Welcome back to my channel where we talk all things general chemistry. My name is Dr. Janita Pritchett, and today on this video, we're going to be covering Chapter 3, Introduction to Compounds and Molecules. Let's get started. If you think back to the previous chapters, when we first introduced matter, we had broke down one side of the, that, that table into two different categories. We were talking about elums versus compounds. So in this chapter, we're really going to be focusing on understanding what compounds are and how they differ from elements. So if we think about elements such as hydrogen or oxygen, we know that these are fundamental elements of life. Um, hydrogen by itself is an explosive gas. It's often used in the space shuttles. Oxygen is a natural component of air, not really flammable by itself. However, when we put these two together, the most common way we're going to find this, this, this compound at room temperature is going to be water. And what you should see from this example is that there are extremely different characteristics in the compound form compared to the element form. Water is a liquid rather than being gas at room temperature and has a rather high boiling point. So the take home message is that properties of compounds are generally going to be very different from the properties of the elements of themselves. And so how water is formed, when we think about the compound water, there's always a consistent ratio of two hydrogen atoms for every one oxygen atom. However, or if we think of it as in form of just the, the typical elements, when we encounter those, those can be in any type of ratio. So big thing we want to remember when we're forming a compound is that there's a specified ratio of the atoms or the elements that would be present. So we learned back in chapter one, whenever we're forming something, when we're creating something, when we're combining things in this chemical change manner, something new must be formed. So when two elements combine together to form a new substance, that process is considered to be a chemical change. For another example, think about table salt. Table salt has a formula of NaCl. However, when we look at sodium by itself, it's a highly reactive silvery metal that can explode if you put it in the water. Whereas chlorine is a corrosive greenish yellow gas that can be fatal if inhaled. However, when these things come together, we create something new that we can actually ingest. So again, the big thing we wanna remember is that something new will be formed. Now, in terms of how the chemicals come together, how these elements come together, they come together through a process known as bonding. All right, so we're gonna focus on two different types of bonds in this chapter. And the first type of bond we're gonna deal with are covalent bonds. Covalent, if we break that word down, co meaning shared, valent, valence, electrons um, that are being shared to make this bond. Now, you'll have a covalent bonding typically occurring when you have a non-metal and a non-metal coming together or a semi-metal and a non-metal coming together. And so think back to how your periodic tables are laid out as such. We know that our metals are found over here on the left, the semi-metals are in this little step, and then the non-metals are found in the corner. So covalent bonding is typically gonna occur when you have non-metals and non-metals coming together, or a non-metal and a semi-metal. The other type of bonding that we have is ionic bonding. And we saw that word ionic, ion, back in chapter two. Ion means there's a charge, and how that charge comes about is through a transfer of electrons. Remember, metals, tend to have fewer number of valence electrons. So they like to kick an electron out or lose an electron and form a positive cation. And non-metals like to take that electron, gain an electron to fill up their valence shell, and they create a negative charge. The positive and negative ions are then able to attract to one another, okay? And so primarily, you're gonna have an ionic comp compound happening whenever you have a metal bonding with a non-metal. There is going to be an example in the, um, a few slides that I'll show you later that a metal won't be involved, but for the most part, you'll have a, a metal must be involved for ionic bonding. So when you're forming this ionic bond, again, you're, you're really kicking out an electron on the metal, gaining an electron on the non-metal, and those two opposites attract to one another. Now, unlike a, a compound like what we saw with water, a molecular compound, when we're forming these ionic compounds or these ionic bonds, what we end up is this array of positive, negative, positive, negative units repeating within that structure. And so what we actually report out is what's called the formula unit or the simplest whole number ratio of the atoms that are found in that compound. 
Now, there are a number of ways that we can represent a chemical formula. Um, primarily, our goal is to understand what elements are there. And so one of the ways that we write the chemical formula is just simply writing what's called the molecular formula, which is actually accounting for the atoms that are present. And so the number of atoms that are present are found in that subscript position. Remember, if you don't see a, a number after uh, a letter, such as in this H2O example, it's one. So we have in this example, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom found in this compound. Um, by convention, when we're listing these metals or we, when we're listing um, the compound formula, we always will list the more metallic element first or the more positively charged ion first, followed by the less metallic or less positively charged element. Okay. And then two main ways that we write this formula is either as the molecular formula, which again is the actual number of the atoms, or the empirical formula, which is the simplest whole number ratio. So let's try a problem. Here we have two, uh, we have a set of formulas, and we want to write both the empirical and molecular formulas for the following compounds. So C4H8, that would represent our molecular formula. Okay, that's telling me how many atoms are present. There's four carbons, eight hydrogens. Now the empirical formula, well now what we're simply going to do is look for that highest common number between those two and then divide that out. In this case, we could divide both of these numbers by four. So therefore, the empirical formula would end up being CH2. Again, we don't have to write the one because the one is applied with whenever you don't see a subscript. For B2H6, the common number there is 2, so we could reduce that down to BH3. For CCL4, there's no number I can divide both of those numbers by, and so what that tells me is that in this case, the molecular and the empirical formula are the same. For C5H12, we have a similar situation. I can't divide out a, a number evenly there, so C5H12 would also be the empirical formula. For HgCl2, what we end up with, well, we can actually divide both by two. So we would have HgCl. And then C2H4O2 can also be divided and simplified to CH2O. And so it's important to be able to recognize when you're writing a molecular formula and how to transition to an empirical formula. Okay, so there are a few ways in which we can actually represent the compounds via a chemical formula. Um, again, the most common way that you'll see it is the molecular formula, where you see the number of atoms that are present. You can also see uh, something that's called the structural formula. Now, in the structural formula, we're actually showing how the atoms are bound to one another. We're going to learn how to do this in later chapters, specifically in my class. It'll be chapter nine. Um, we could also show the ball and stick model. Where now this ball and stick model is helping us to understand the orientation of the atoms. What angle are these elements uh, at uh, reflective to one another? Um, and it also gives us an idea of the size and the, the amount of space that these things take up. We'll talk about that in chapter 10. And then the space filling model, again, is really now putting some size to these atoms. Um, again, with each of these different formats, we get a little bit of different information. So depending on what our purpose is, we may have to be able to write one or the other as needed. So we can actually further divide this idea of compounds in atoms even further. So remember, we had a chart that we saw in chapter one where we saw that we could take uh, elements or take matter and divide it into either being a pure substance or a mixture. And so now we're going to take the pure substance side and break it down even further. So our pure substances, again, can either be elements or compounds. Those two main categories can be broken down even further. So for the element side, we could have either atomic elements or molecular elements. And if you look at the picture, what you should see is that in an atomic element, it's a single atom. So these are elements that can exist as singular atoms. Whereas molecular elements are those that exist as two or more atoms. So you can see in this case here, there's two atoms there that are connected together. It's the same thing, but two things connected together. So molecular elements are those elements that cannot exist as singular elements. And then there's a su small subset of ones that you're going to need to know, and I'll show those in a few slides. On the other side, for our compounds, we can break that down into being either a molecular compound 
or an ionic compound. And that's really based on what kind of elements we have present and what kind of bonding is taking place. In molecular compounds, much like with molecular elements, you see two or more things bound together. However, the difference between a molecular compound and a molecular element is that a molecular compound has two different types of atoms present. So you can see here. For an ionic compound, ionic compounds are those that form through ionic bonding. And with those compounds, you actually do not end up with individual discrete molecules. Notice what you have is a repeating structure of positive and negative units that are combined to make this lattice structure. What we report out because of that repeating unit structure, we actually report out what's called a formal unit of an ionic compound rather than calling it a molecular compound or a molecule, okay? So again, your basic elements, those are gonna be atomic elements. Those are those that can exist as single atoms as their basic fundamental unit. Molecular elements are those that cannot exist as single atoms. And so these are things that have to have two or more atoms bound together, two or more of the same atom bound together to form its natural existing state. So the set that you wanna know, um, the first ones are your diatomic molecules. And so if you break that word di, di means two. So these are um, atoms that actually have to exist as with two atoms present for its uh, pure form. And so fortunately for you, there's seven of them. And if you look at where they're located on the periodic table, they actually form a huge seven. And so the seven that you need to know are iodine, bromine, chlorine, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And so what that means when you encounter any of these elements in their pure state, it'll actually be O2 or H2 as written. They can be any other amount whenever they're in a compound, but when they're by themselves, it's always O2, F2, so forth, okay? We also have a set of atoms that are um, called polyatomic molecules or polyatomic elements. And those are those that exist with poly, meaning many, so many atoms present. So something like S8, P4 and even selenium all actually exist as these multi-atom units. So again, the great thing about the uh, seven diatomics is that they form a huge seven on your periodic table. And so you can see those uh, seven that are shown for you here. A saying that I came up with to help me remember these, and it may help you, it may not, I'm a big fan of mnemonic devices, is I bring clay, for our new house. And that allowed me a quick way to think about what letters or what elements form this big seven that have this diatomic property. And so if you look at this mnemonic device, we're looking at the first couple of letters or first letter uh, for each of the words. So I bring clay for our new house represents iodine, bromine, clay, uh, chlorine, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Try that out, hopefully it works. It's worked for me since I, I had to learn that a long time ago. <laughs> so again, these are making uh, that huge seven. And then our other polyatomic ions are shown for you here. Uh, we have phosphorus, sulfur, and selenium. And those actually sit right in a little nook um, in that, that seven, okay? So you can see those for you here. Now, when we focus on our compounds, again, there are two different types of compounds that exist. There are molecular compounds and those that typically will not have a metal present. So these are gonna be non-metal, non-metals bound together or non-metal, semi-metal bound together. With molecular compounds, molecular compounds bond through covalent bonding, meaning they're sharing their electrons. And most importantly, you wanna remember that these do exist as individual molecules. Whereas ionic compounds, those cannot exist as individual molecules. Instead, they exist as this repeating crystal lattice structure. 99% of the time, a metal will be present. And I'll show you an example where uh, that does not take place. But for the most part, a metal will be present when you're doing ionic, uh, forming ionic compounds. And last but not least, they're gonna bond through ionic bonding, meaning they're transferring electrons rather than sharing electrons. And so this is just a nice picture representation for you here. You can see that uh, on the left, we have our molecular compound, these individual discrete units of these compounds. 
Whereas in the ionic model, you have positive and negative, positive and negative ions that are repeating. And what we report out is that simplest whole number ratio. So let's put all that together and try to uh, make some prediction about what these, these elements are or compounds are. All right, so we have O2. That would be a molecular element. Sodium, that would be an atomic element. And I always stress to my students, be careful there because a lot of people will see it's a metal and say, oh, well, that just means that I have to, uh, it's a, it has to be an ionic compound because there's a metal present. But we wanna remember a compound is only when you have two or more things present, different things, all right? So NaCl in this case, this would be an ionic compound. C4H8 would be a molecular compound. Remember, although hydrogen sits on the left side of the periodic table, it is actually a non-metal when we're doing this classification. Barium is an atomic element. Lithium hydroxide is an ionic compound because of the lithium. C3H8, that would be a molecular compound, no metal. And then S8 is our molecular element. It's an element because it's multiple L atoms there, but it's the same type of atom. So that's one of our molecular elements. Then we have xenon, which would be an atomic element. Nickel two chloride would be an ionic compound. Bromine two would be molecular element. NO2 would be molecular compound, two different things, no metal. Sodium nitrate would be an ionic compound. F2 would be a molecular element. Ag would be a atomic element. And last but not least, K2O would be a ionic compound because we have that metal present. I hope this video helped you understand the difference between the different types of compounds that exist. Stay tuned for more videos. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more things that you would like to see. Have a great day. See you guys in the next video. Bye.